Good morning. Welcome to the Bible class, East Main Church of Christ. Glad you're joining us this hour for our Bible study. We'll be studying Ephesus chapter 3 this morning. I'm going to go ahead and pull our uh, PowerPoint up. There we go. I'm really enjoying this study in Ephesus and hope that you are. Uh, try to keep these around 30 minutes or less. Uh, sometimes I go over a little bit, but I try not to. Uh, so hopefully you can hang in there. We're going to uh, try to stay within those guidelines again. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul wrote this to the uh, church there at Ephesus. In verse 1, it says, For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Uh, for what cause, Paul? What are you talking about? Well, we have to go back into chapter 2 to know what he's talking about. So if we go back into chapter 2, we look at these themes that he's talking about. The themes that, that he was just talking about is our citizenship in heaven. Uh, in how the Gentiles were now part of this spiritual temple of God. Uh, we talked about the uh, living stones as mentioned in first Peter. Uh, you know, he, he mentions this same type concept, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone uh, of this spiritual house that's built up the, the, the church is what he's talking about. The spiritual temple, uh, it's not made with hands, it's made with individuals, and each individual being a stone in this temple uh, of where God dwells. Uh, we also talked about the, uh, uh, the concept that uh, being adopted children. So because Jesus Christ went to the cross and that he shared uh this this great love for everyone that we all can now have access to the father and that we all can be uh, considered his adopted children in verse 2 if ye have learned of the dispensation of the grace of god which is given me to you word uh, we're in the disp Christian dispensation. There's been three dispensations. There is the uh, patriarchal dispensation, which is, this is when God talked directly to man. We see this, he talked directly to Adam in the garden. We see he talked directly to Noah, told him to uh, build this ark when there had not been rain on the earth. Said, yeah, I'll build this big boat. He talked directly to Abraham. He told him he would bless him uh, as the stars in heaven and the, and the sands uh, on the seashore, that his descendants would be that many. So we, we, we see in this patriarchal age, he talked to these, uh, these patriarchal men, these fathers of these households, talked directly to them. But when Moses went to the leading the children out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness. They went to Mount Sinai. He went and met God and got the Ten Commandments. He, he, we had the, what we call the mosaical dispensation. So no longer does God talk to the individual heads of households, but he talks to, uh, talk to us through the prophets and through Moses, uh, and so we had this Old Testament. This is also referred to sometimes as a Jewish dispensation. So it was for the Jews, and that was God's chosen people. Now, since Paul's writing this, shortly after AD 33, after Jesus had uh, died and is uh, uh, risen again on the third day and resurrected into heaven, we're in the first century. So now, in the first century, the dispensation has changed when Jesus was nailed to the cross. It changed from the Jewish dispensation to the Christian dispensation. 
and people still think the Jewish dispensation is still going on uh, at this time uh, that Paul is writing this epistle. And so he's educating them that we're in a new dispensation. We're in dispensation of the grace of God. And Paul said, this was given to me and also to you being Gentiles because Paul was a sinner. He was persecuting Christians. And now this grace has been extended to him. In verse three, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in a few words. Paul's told them this before that of this mystery that's being made known. The mystery is basically that the Gentiles are now included as fellow heirs in this uh, Christian dispensation, that they can be fellow heirs of God and receive these riches, these spiritual blessings that God was given just to the Jews. Now it's for everyone. And it was through uh, the revelation that Paul known this. Yeah, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, but he has been inspired by the by these angels and by the Holy Spirit, uh, by the Holy Spirit to write these words in the New Testament, as all the New Testament authors are. In verse four, it says, "Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ." Paul wasn't coming off the top of his head with this. This is information that was given to him by the Holy Spirit. And he says, you can read these epistles that I'm writing for you. You need to, you know what? They need to keep this. They need to share it with all the churches in, the, in that area because this is important. This mystery that is being made known right here to all of them. You remember in, in verse, uh, in chapter two, he said, that you have been made alive. They have been made alive at this time. They were dead. They had no hope of salvation, but now they have been made alive. They're just, they can access God just like the Jews can. And matter of fact, if the Jews don't change into the Christian dispensation, they're not gonna be able to access God. They have to change because uh, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament, the Messiah, and the new law went into effect. His Testament, as we learn in Hebrews, the death of the testor brings on the uh, life or the beginning of the New Testament, his will and testament for man, which is the churches for everyone. Verse five, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, but is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Again, we see Spirit capitalized. That's the Holy Spirit. It's being made known unto the apostles and prophets at this time. And so they are teaching people in the, in the first century of this, uh, what's going on, uh, of this new church, that the Gentiles should be, fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So there you go. There's the mystery revealed in verse six right there. That's the mystery that was hidden before time and has now been known to all men that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. We talked about being fellow heirs uh, about this inheritance, about being the adopted children of God. Now they're poor. We all, as Gentiles, can have the hope of salvation. We can inherit salvation because of Jesus Christ, by this promise of Christ in the gospel. If we are in Christ and in his church, his body, which he is ahead of. In verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. You know, grace is a gift. It's not something that we earn. It is a gift. And Paul said, you know what? I was the chiefest of sinners. And for God to save me, he made me a minister of Christianity. And before that, 
Paul hold, held, and when he was Saul, he held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. He pulled people out of their houses and beat them and threw them in jail for being Christians. He persecuted Christians. And he's saying, you know, how is it that, that I was made a minister of Christianity? It's crazy. It's crazy to think about that this could have happened to me, but it's because of the gift of the grace of God. By the effectual working of his power, God's power, it, it's unbelievable. You just can't fully understand what he's capable of. Verse eight, unto me who am least of least of all saints. And he said that because he did persecute Christians. In this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles and searchable riches of Christ. How crazy is that, is what he's saying. <laughs> the unsearchable riches of Christ. I, you know, I love uh, watching uh, people that, uh, shows and everything that, that people are hunting different treasures. And, you know, you had Indiana Jones and, and he's searching for the Ark of the Covenant. There's a, actually a show I watched today uh, called The Curse of Oak Island. And these, these group of men are actually, they think that the, you know, there's all these things that what could be buried 200 feet below the ground there. It's in Nova Scotia, Canada. And uh, that possibly the, the Ark of the Covenant's buried there. Or then it's, there's all these different theories. You know, it could be, uh, you know, uh, some gold and everything from some uh, lost thing, a tribe in, in Brazil or, or in, uh, in South America or something. There's all these theories of what it is. Some Spanish galleon ships buried it. And so they, they talk about the, uh, it's, it's a treasure hunt. And everybody loves a treasure hunt. And everybody's searching for this treasure. People search for gold and silver and, and, and jewels and all these things, history, great items of value in history. People search for these things forever but what we have in christ the unsearchable riches you can't just search and dig in the ground and find something like this it's given to you it's you know i bet you that there's four or five bibles or more in your house you probably got phones that's got Bible apps, you probably got the computer and, and pads and tablets and all these things that has Bible. Apps. You have the Word of God at your fingertips and you can study it. You know, men have died trying to protect the Word of God. There, there, there was, there's been people that's tried to stamp it out, tried to get rid of it, they tried to burn Bibles. And yet we have numerous copies of it. We'll not be able to get rid of it. Verse nine, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. I talked about that show, well, God, I was thinking about this when I read this verse. They talk about the fellowship of the dig. You know, and it's because this group of guys have gotten together and it's kind of a brotherhood. They all believe that, that there's some big treasure buried in the ground about 200 feet there. And they enjoy each other's company. They go out to eat together. Uh, you know, they share meals together. It's, it's kind of a brotherhood. They encourage each other. Hey, there really is a treasure and we're going to find it and all the same. You know, it's kind of like the fellowship of Christians. We all want to get to heaven. It, when we fellowship with with other Christians, we enjoy the company of other Christians. We want to encourage each other to remain faithful to God. We believe that there is a God in heaven, that he did send his only begotten son to this earth uh, to be crucified of men and to be raised on the third day and then ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God until the day of judgment when God shall call back those of, own, of his own those that he loves, those that's a part of Christ's body, the church, the church of Christ, Christ's church. 
when you're a member of God's body, of Christ's body, the church. You have access to God. And you will be called up. If you remain faithful, you will be a faithful member of this church. You will see God. And you will get to experience heaven. He said, you know, this was a mystery in the world. But it was hid in God. But now he's, be, he's making known this mystery. People didn't understand the great plan. You know, some people think the guy's just playing chess with somebody, with the devil. And the devil moves this, this, uh, this pawn here or something. And then God said, oh, i got to change my plan. No, this ain't how it is. God already had the chess board already planned out. And all the moves already planned out. It's the devil that didn't know what was going on. It's the mankind that didn't know everything that was going on. God's already got this checkmate. He already has defeated Satan. When Christ went to the cross, that crushed the head of Satan. You look back in Genesis, when uh, God is getting on to Adam and Eve for sinning in the garden, and he is going to crushed the head of the serpent. He crushed the head of serpent, Satan, already. When Jesus was crucified and rose again on the third day, that sealed his fate. He has been defeated. It's just a matter of time of when it's all going to come to an end. In verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You know, all the, I'm sure that the, the, the devil didn't know what he was doing when, when, when he said, hey, let's, let's, let's trick Judas into turning him in and let's crucify him and get all the people to, to let Jesus be crucified and let Barabbas go. He's like, I got him. But no, you didn't. You didn't get him, Satan. You didn't understand. The grand plan here. The grand plan is that that was needed to defeat you, and that these the church is now opened up and for everyone body. And, you know this manifold wisdom of God. We think we don't understand the God's will. His thinking is way above our thinking. We cannot think like God thinks. We. His thinking is so above ours, this manifold wisdom of its various forms of wisdom that we can't even comprehend. Our minds can't comprehend what heaven is like. And therefore, he describes it in terms that we understand streets of gold. You know, uh, that's something that I can picture. I can picture streets of gold. Do I think there's streets of gold in heaven? No, I don't. Well, wait a minute. Now the Bible, no. the Bible is painting us a picture of something that we know is the most precious uh, thing here on this earth, and that's gold. It doesn't tarnish after years and years and years. It can still be as beautiful as it was two thousand years ago. I I seen uh, uh, pictures of uh, you know King Tut's tomb and all the things that were in they had the thing in memphis and i didn't go to it but i've seen it i, I went when i was in south america one time and uh i seen we went to this gold uh when i was in uh, columbia my sister was born in columbia so we went down there and my, my parents went to this museum that had all these they had something there and i don't know it was king tug was something i don't think it was but it was it was a lot of gold and everything that was brought in egypt from the days that they had the pyramids, you know, and that stuff was just as beautiful then as it was way back then, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, however long it was. Uh, it was crazy uh, how, how this can be preserved over the years. In verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. 
Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul said that we can have boldness and we can access with confidence by the faith of him. Because we are in Christ Jesus, he has, he says that he has purposed, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This eternal purpose that we have, that Christ had, that he brought together all of us in the body of Christ. And that because of this, because we are now all brought together in this body of Christ, even though that we weren't born Jewish, we can be bold and we can access and have confidence in our faith that he is going to save us and we are his adopted children, that we're part of the church. Paul is saying here in verse 13, he doesn't want those in Ephesus to be worried about him being in prison. He's in prison right here. Uh, in, you know, he's in a Roman prison. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. So you would think he'd be like, oh, please pray for me. I'm, you know, I'm in this awful prison and y'all please keep me in your prayers no he's not saying he, he's like you know what uh, i don't want you to work because i'm in prison i don't want this to hurt your faith because you know what it, i'm fine i'm doing this for your glory in verse 14 for this cause i bow my knees unto the father of our lord jesus of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Paul is going to God in prayer. He, he bows down on his knees. Now, that is an acceptable posture, stance of prayer, to be on your knees. Now, we also... You can pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. But, you know, there is something about getting on your knees and praying to God that helps put you in the right mindset. I like to do this when I'm alone. When I'm alone in my bedroom and nobody else is there, I can get on my knees and kneel down to God. And I think that we all should do that from time to time to humble ourselves, to let us know that uh, we are, to let God know that we are so grateful and humble in his presence. It says the whole family in earth, in heaven and earth is named Jesus Christ. We are simply Christians. That's how we're named, we're Christians. They were called Christians first in Antioch. And when we talk about the church of Christ, we're talking about the church. Whose church is it? It's Christ's church, the church of Christ. We are Christians. And so it, when you see all these different religions and, 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 and they don't, they're not named Christians, uh, you know, they have a different name that they're going by. Is that biblical? But I know that the church is biblical. I know that Christ's church is biblical. The church of Christ is biblical. In Romans 16, 16, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. This strength that we're given by the Holy Spirit in the inner man, I don't understand this. I don't. I don't think anybody on this earth can explain the Holy Spirit. We don't fully understand this Holy Spirit and this inner man. We know we have the, the outer man. And in the, the outer man, that's where this fruit of the Spirit that we talked about uh when we're talking about Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, these 
things that we do outwardly, but there is this inner man. You know, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, and mind. Where is the heart, soul, and mind? It's right here. All of this is right. It, it's, it's, it's our thinking. How does this, how do we differentiate these three things? I don't know. I don't fully understand that. Why would it mention three things rather than two or, or one? I don't know. I don't fully understand. We can't fully understand, but we know with all of our being, with all of our mind, that God's going to give us strength. And that we know that when we're faithful to him, and I can't explain it, but I know that when I'm faithful to him, my conscience, my subconscious, my overall being, I have peace within me. And, and it's all right here. I can have this mind of intellect that I can study and I can know what's, I can decipher right and wrong, truth, not truth. And I can do that from deductive reasoning and these type things. But then also there is this, this other level of understanding, this other level of, of peace, of love that you just, I, you, can't under, you can't explain it. But, it. but you know it. You know it when you feel it. Uh, you know that, that, that you're saved. You know that this is the truth. This is the truth of God's word. You just know it. Uh, in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Being rooted and grounded in love. And so when we're faithful and, and when Christ dwells in our hearts and we're constantly dwelling in Christ and Christ dwells in us. And, and we're rooted and grounded in love and we're, we're experiencing uh, love from God, from Christ, and we give that love to others. Then we're able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and the depth, and the height of this love. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth, passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. When are going, we going to be filled with all the fullness of God? You know, I don't think we're really going to feel all of that until we get to heaven. There's a lot that we don't un fully comprehend and understand that we will one day when we get to heaven. And we get up there and, and we don't find out. We won't care at that point because we'll be in heaven. But, you know, in verse 18 there, Paul's describing these four different dimensions that describe God's, Jesus' love for us. You know, this breath. You know, you, you heard people say, I love you this much. God loves everyone. You know, Jew, Greek, uh, male, female, Rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Everyone, it doesn't matter what geographical location you're in. God loves everybody. The breadth of his love, we can't understand. The length, how, you know, how long is it till the end of our, no. Not till the end of our lives, it's for eternity. It's forever. God's going to love us forever. He's promised a home in heaven for eternity. What about the depth? of God's love. I don't, you know, and I don't know what these dimensions exactly mean, but I just want you to think about these different dimensions. Why did Paul write this? I think it's just to help us to, to think about how massive God's love is for us. 
We can't fully comprehend everything now, but we can comprehend God's love. The, the depth of this love, it, it's so deep. It's so deep that he, he sent part of the Godhead that was there to help create the heavens, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin here on this earth. And for him to be crucified on a cross, ridiculed by men. And, you know, we talked about this. He could have, or I man, I think I talked about this in another Bible study, but he could have called, uh, we sing this song, 10,000 angels. Well, really, he could have called, you know, 12 legions of angels. You look about legion is 6,000 Roman soldiers back in that time. So six times 12, uh, 6,000 times 12 legions would be 72,000 angels. We could have called more than that, the verse says. He could have called 100,000. The point is he could have got out of it. He could have got out of this by just speaking to the angels, to God, and says, please send somebody down here and take me away from this. I can't go through with this. But he didn't. Christ's love for us, it's hard to comprehend. The height is from here all the way into heaven to the, high, to the highest heights of heaven. I love these dimensions that Paul mentions in here. It makes you think of his love and how great it is for us and that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. It fills us. It makes us to feel good. It's all that we need in this life. Do we need food, clothing, and shelter? Yes, but if you have food, clothing, if you have God, he is going to give you food, clothing, and shelter, and that's all you need. That's all you need here on this earth. Now, on verse 20, now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You know, I'm not an English major, but that looks like two adverbs in the same, <laughs> exceedingly abundantly. It's a lot. It's a lot. And above all that we ask or think, you know, uh, ask and you shall receive. Uh, do we ask? Do we ask God for things to put us in the right spiritual mindset? We need to. He's able to do a lot more than we can even possibly think of. You know, it was said that in the Bible that if we had the faith of a little mustard seed, we could move a mountain if we had that much faith. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us. So we have, we can do more than we think we can do. You know, I know there has been people put in, uh, you know, stressful situations that have overcome these situations, their, their, their physical bodies was able to do more than it ever has before because of the situation that they were in. We can do more for Christ than we think we can. You can do more than you're doing. And you may think, well, I'm doing, you know, this and that. You can do more. I can do more the power that is in us and what we can do is very powerful. You just think about if you could teach one person and that one person teach one person. Maybe that person teaches two persons. Maybe one of those persons teaches three or four persons. One of them becomes a gospel preacher. And one of them saves thousands and thousands in their generations to come. Just because you taught one person. That's right. Unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, 
world without end. Amen. The world without end, amen. We are part of God's family. We're a part of the church of Christ. Part of this body of believers that believes that Jesus was a son of God, that he did go to the uh, cross of Calvary, that we can have forgiveness of our sins. That he, because he did willingly go to that cross and was resurrected on the third day, we can be baptized believers. And when we rise out of the waters of baptism, to walk in this new life, new creatures in Christ. We have to be in Christ. That we can access heaven. We have access to God by being the spiritual body of Christ. One of these stones in this spiritual temple called the church. Thank you for attending Bible class today.